Even though The Ghosts of Edendale isn't an effects-driven movie, there are effects. Our first shock comes when Rachel opens the closet door. This was a situation that originally wasn't going to have any effects. After the first cut, I realized it needed help. First thing I did was do a pencil drawing rendition of the boy to, so that I could get a rough idea of the planes that I'd be working with. And then I took each area of his face and decided to distort it and make it wrinkled in old age and just zombie almost, just disgusting in whatever way I could think of. And then I took all of these drawings, scanned them into Photoshop and began arranging them on the face. Then of course I had to go in and by hand I had to as the kid moves slowly within the frame, I had to track each point to make sure that it stuck. Additionally, we did a speed ramp. What made this tricky is that she is still in real time while the kid whizzes out of there. That meant we had to divide the shot up, get rid of the boy, create a clean plate, and then put him back in. Here, we shot the clean, empty version of the scene first. This is our clean plate. This is just the background, no actors. Then we went back and shot the actors walking up in front of green screens. This was shot much later in time, but since we had access to the same hill, we went back and set everything up as closely as possible. That way, we'd get many of the angles right. This is a shot that a motion control rig would be perfect for, but of course not having that kind of money meant doing it manually. Luckily, this wasn't too hard a shot to match. We slowed the motion of the actors down to give them a more ghostly quality. Then I went to work adding vapors and glows, your standard ghost stuff. Finally, after it's all put together, this is what we had. Hey partner, are you a good guy or a bad guy? Now, so when I'm in post, I'll be like, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> For the dream sequence, we wrapped chroma green around Steve's face so that we could neutralize that section easily. With a lockdown camera, we had Steve perform the scene and then clear frame. This allowed us to shoot a clean background, which we could use for compositing. Here's an example of what that looks like. Sometimes you see this happen to the weatherman when their clothes is too green or blue in color. I shot some stuff with a flesh corpse head against a green screen and then gave the various elements to Scott Hale. My next step was to take all these elements and blend them together to form one seamless effect. I figured the best way to do that would be using a similar technique that I employed with the ghost boy in the closet. And that would be to take traditional drawings and bring those into the computer and use those as band-aids for the different edges. So I created, I created all these drawn elements of wrinkles and highlights and shadows in order to blend them together with what we already had. So again, each of these elements was brought into the computer and then laid in over top of where it should have been to create the final effect of the cowboy's face appearing to be rotted off and then evaporating away. Here's the shot as it appears in the film. Don't blink. For the climactic Rachel really starts to lose it scene, we did everything we could afford to do. Most everything you see here, except for the wire removal, was done in After Effects. The wire removal was done with commotion. For those of you who want to also do a special effects movie, though all this software isn't really cheap, it's still well within the reach of an indie filmmaker, so I highly suggest learning it. They really are incredible tools to have. For you tech geeks, these mats here were done with extract filters. 
You can see all the telephone wires and, and nothing looks like it's been affected. This is an example of really using the right technique for the job. Okay, let's break this down a little. I had an idea of time going backwards, like the whole place was reverting to 1915. It was one of those things where people were asking me, how are you going to do that? Okay, I shot some stills with a digital camera and then started playing with some concepts. When I saw that this crazy idea would work, I shot Paula doing the scene. Okay, cut. I cut the sequence together and then did a very rough version of what I had in mind. Okay. And I gave this to Scott Hale, who took over from there. The first thing I did was create bunches of hands. This would eventually become a fractal-like edge to the time wave. I also added a horse running up the hill sequence, which added a cool story element to the effects. In the early versions here, you can see how the horse and rider are still floating around in the shot. This would be taken care of manually, a painstaking process. Now, the changing effect is getting more organic. Adding smoke and natural elements like film grain help this along also. On the reverse angle, similar work was done. Again, the hands acted as the initial edge. Then the cowboy was added and we also added storm clouds to the sky and a glow vapor effect to the cowboy. Once the shots are color timed and properly film looked, I think we get a scene that looks pretty cool. Of course, great music and sound effects really finish it off. Around the top corner, again, the same occurred. The key here was figuring out what the hill would look like 88 years ago, since the horizon line would become visible. You can also see with each render how the tracking is improved on moving objects and how glows, smoke, and other elements are added. So those are the basic techniques that were used for many of the effects in the movie. This scene is a very important one to the movie because it really represents the whole idea of past and present combining, and the idea of everybody being some type of ghost, including her. We shot the scene normally with no motion control cameras or anything. After I edited the scene, we took it into After Effects and started drawing masks. These masks had to be accurate around the ghosts and anywhere the Rachel character comes into contact with them, like if she's moving in front of them or behind them. You'll notice that if she's not near a ghost, the mask doesn't matter. It was an incredibly tedious job that required a lot of accuracy. We spread this work out among four people. Marianne Connor, the producer, C.J. Bao, Mike Fuchs, and myself. Though in a situation like this, you do something called keyframing, which is to let the computer do all the work in between two defining frames, it's an amazing amount of work, and since there was so much movement in this scene, pretty nearly every frame had to be done manually. So there wasn't really a whole lot of keyframing going on. And for you trivia lovers, there are 3,299 frames in this scene. Once we had the masks drawn and animated, I could add effects that would only affect the specific masked sections. I created an old movie ghost effect, and that was how we made ghosts. Ghosts of Edendale. <laughs>